One of our favorite movies that we watch as a family, uh, some of you I think will be familiar with it, it's called The Princess Bride. Anyone ever seen The Princess Bride? Quick show of hands. Okay. For those who have not, I won't go into great detail on it, but there is a princess, Buttercup, who is um, kidnapped, and there are three guys in this gang that uh, perform the, the, the kidnapping. There's one who's the brains of the group. There's one who's the brawn, and that's actually the wrestler Andre the Giant, if you're familiar with him. He stars in that as well. And then there's one who's a swordsman. And they, they kidnap the, the princess, and they're making their way, and they start to have conversations. And the guy who's the brains of the group, he loves to say a word over and over and over again. Inconceivable. Inconceivable. And so at different points, they're saying, hey, somebody might be following. That's inconceivable. Oh, we're going to climb up this mountain. How's he doing that? That's inconceivable. And he keeps going over and over and over again. Inconceivable, inconceivable, inconceivable. And finally, the guy who's the swordsman with a bit of a, I guess, a Hispanic or accent says, he keeps saying that word. I do not think it means what him think it means. Right? And so if you've seen it, he, he keeps saying that, that what is happening with the hero in the story, it's just not even conceivable. You can't even imagine that this guy is doing these things. That's actually tied to our message today. See, what we're going to talk about today with, with Palm Sunday, for many at that time, what's coming this week and Holy Week at that time would be inconceivable. Like I said, open your Bibles to Matthew 21. Let's talk today about Palm Sunday. This is a Holy Week as celebrated in the church around the world today. Generally referred to as Palm Sunday, this is when Jesus has his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And as he goes in, we're going to read about palm branches or branches being used. And the reason that we call this Palm Sunday is that these branches that were laid down we believe, based upon the part of the world that it's in, and then the idea of the royalty that's attached to it, that these were palms that were laid down. And so we get the phrasing Palm Sunday. I'm going to read through the passage, and then we will work through it verse by verse. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem... And came to Bethphage, or Phage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. 
Have you never read out of the mouths, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city of Bethany and lodged there. May God bless the hearing of his word and this sermon. As we look at Palm Sunday, this actually is not that disconnected from the book of Daniel that we have been going through. For you guests, we have been going through the the book of Daniel for a couple of months now. And depending on how you interpret the 70 weeks and the 490 years, which I took a couple weeks to explain to you and confuse you and myself in the process, but depending on how you interpret the 490 years or the 70 weeks, One interpretation that I shared with you would say that this is the beginning of the 69th week, this day in particular. And that may very well be. I also submitted to you that this would be the 70th week, and we're coming up on midway through. The 70th week would have began at his baptism, and we're midway through where he's going to die. Either way, this time frame is important and linked to Daniel chapter 9, where we have been. This is the coming of the king. Or at least the first coming of the king. As we were going through, I explained to you that God's judgment had been on the nation of Israel. That's why they were taken from the land in the Babylonian captivity. And we saw that God revealed to Daniel as the captivity was coming close to an end or had ended that there was still going to be a lot of hard times to come. And if you look at the context of the book of Matthew, you see over and over and over again through parables and Jesus' sayings, his teachings, that the temple is going to be destroyed and God's people, Israel, are going to feel the judgment of God again because they are rejecting God. They are rejecting the Messiah. So let's work through the passage together and see what God might have for us today. Beginning in verse 1 again. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. So they're, they're coming to Jerusalem. They have been traveling along. This is the culmination of what Jesus' ministry is to be, and they're coming. And Jesus says, hey, I need two of you disciples. Go. Go into the village in front of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now he has to add this little thing because this would be stealing, it would seem. So he has to add this. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. Look at that. Don't miss that. If you go in somebody's yard and you're going to take their animals and somebody goes, oh, 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 somebody needs them. What would they normally say? I, no, I don't care. Get off my stuff. But the Lord would be working in their hearts preparing them that it's time for the Messiah to come. So, If anyone asks, say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Verse 4 helps us. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Which prophet? Zechariah. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. Should just be a few pages. Somebody's like, oh no, Zechariah. It's one of those minor prophets. I don't know where it's at. Just go a few, I don't know, 20 or 30 pages probably in your Bible back the other way. I should have looked up in the Pew Bible for you. Zechariah chapter 9. This prophet writing here talks about the coming judgment on Israel's enemies. This happens so that prophecy would be fulfilled and everyone would see that Jesus is the Messiah. But I need you to hear some of the things that are said in this passage. Starting in verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of the donkey. That's where this is coming from. Verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. 
And the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Verse 14, Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones. They shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine and be full like a bowl trenched in the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of His people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on His land. For how great is His goodness and how great is His beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish and new wine the young women. When you hear that, if you're familiar with that prophecy, the king is coming and he's going to defeat all of our enemies and we will reign with him. And the people respond. Watch. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and they put them on their cloaks because he's the king and so he has to sit on the cloaks. And he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the ground and they, they're cutting these branches, most likely palm branches, from the trees and they're spreading them out on the road because the king is coming. And he's coming to bring us victory. He's going to set us free. We've been oppressed. We've not had our land. He is coming. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! The son of David. Blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That is coming straight out of Psalm 118. Again, we always want to look back and see what's going on. Let me read some of Psalm 118 to you. This is talking about God's steadfast love and how it endures forever. Listen, starting in verse 14, Psalm 118, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but He has not given me over to death. Israel, they know, the Lord has disciplined us. But now's the day. He's coming for the kingdom. Open to me, verse 19, the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you you that you have answered me and you've become my salvation the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone this is the lord's doing it is a marvel it is marvelous in our eyes this is the day that the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it he's coming to deliver us the kingdom defeating all of our enemies verse 25 save us we pray O oh Lord, O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. You know what that is? Verse 25. Do you know what that is? The save us, we pray? That's the word Hosanna. It's a combination you can see on your notes here between two Hebrew words, Yasha and Anna. You ever thought about what does Hosanna actually mean? We say it, we sing it. What does it actually mean? When you break down those two words... A good translation would be, please save us. Or, we beg you to deliver us. This is similar to what we actually see the chapter before. In chapter 20, before he comes for the triumphal entry. There were two blind men starting in Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. And as they went out to Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. 
And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. We're hearing this language of son of David over and over again. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more. The crowd said, be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. But he's coming, and they know they have no other hope than the son of David. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? What is it that you really want? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And then it leads right into the triumphal entry. You have to understand that when they keep referring to the son of David, this is coming out of 2 Samuel chapter 7. The Davidic covenant where it says to David, there's going to be somebody, we read it earlier, somebody on the throne forever from your family. And he's going to come and he's going to make everything right. And so the people here, these two blind men, the lame people later in the chapter that we read, all the people who are putting down the palm branches in their coats, they're saying, he's here, come. And here's what they're saying when they're saying, Hosanna, please save us. Please deliver us. Would you do that? You're the son of David. You're supposed to come and save us. Back in our Matthew 21, verse 9, so again, and the crowds that went before him and they followed him, they're shouting, Hosanna, Psalm 118, save us, deliver us. This is the day the Lord has made, deliver us, God. The son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Save us in the highest, O God. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this? What's going on? Why is everyone yelling about about the son of David? Is is the time here? Who is this? And somebody explains that this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, which is actually a fulfillment of prophecy as well from Micah chapter 5. So notice this is the scene. Are you seeing the scene? Are you seeing everybody just worshiping and excited that the king is coming? So Jesus then goes straight to the temple because they're not worshiping like they're supposed to be. They're trying to get from God what they want. So they are abusing the temple. And with a picture of God's wrath that's coming, Jesus goes in in his anger and flips tables and condemns them for their actions. I want to remind you here that just before Jesus had gone into Jerusalem, he actually sat and wept over them. He wept because they would not believe. He wept because he knew they were rejecting him. He wasn't surprised by this. This is actually part of the whole overall plan. And he knew that everything was going to be destroyed soon. So after he clears out the temple, look at verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. He has mercy on the the blind and the lame. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the teachers, the pastors of the day, if you will, when they see him, oh, look, he's healing, and and he's here. Look how they respond. They hear the children crying out, Hosanna, save us, son of David, and they were indignant. They can't say that because the Pharisees had their idea of what the Messiah would be. And they didn't like anybody else being more popular than they were. So then he says to them in verse 16, or they say to him, do you hear what these are saying, and Jesus said to them, yes, teachers of the law, have you not read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? If you read Luke's account of this story, the same type of thing happens, but instead he says, if you all aren't praising me, the rocks will do it. This is the context for Palm Sunday. But I need you to follow me for a moment here. Everybody had their expectation of who the Messiah was. 
Everybody was ready for him to come and deliver the way that they understood. And as he was coming to town, they finally were saying, please save us, please deliver us. And the same people, don't miss this, the same people who are yelling Hosanna on this Sunday will be yelling crucify in the coming week. The same people. The ones who are there, Hosanna in the highest, he's here to save us and deliver us. But because he comes, which they missed on the donkey, not on the war horse, because his first coming was coming to save us, to serve us, to die for us. And they didn't want that Messiah. They wanted the Messiah that brings in the kingdom that they can reign and finally be delivered from the Romans. What they didn't understand is they have to be delivered from their sin and the wrath of God first. So they're yelling, Hosanna, and later they're yelling, crucify, because they do not understand who he is. So as we're here on Palm Sunday, and as we're thinking about our Lord and the idea of Hosanna in the coming King, we look forward to his return. But friends, we're not yelling Hosanna. We're not yelling Hosanna right now. See, they were yelling Hosanna because they're saying, please deliver us. Please, please deliver us. Set us free. Our Hosanna turns to a hallelujah. Amen. Because he has delivered us he has set us free and we're waiting for his return but there are people all over who do not know that some of them don't even know that they should be saying hosanna in the first place and so we say hallelujah and we praise our god what's interesting is the people could not conceive of this plan it was inconceivable to them. They couldn't imagine that God would take on flesh. That He would come and He would ride on a donkey and He would humbly come and die the death we should have died on that cross, willingly as part of the plan, but to defeat sin, Satan, and death and three days later rise. It wasn't even conceivable. It was inconceivable to them. That's why it's from God. God. That's why it's his plan. Every other religion, they have a plan of how we're going to get saved, maybe, if we work at it. God's plan, you can't do it, so I'm going to send my son to do it for you. Hosanna, not today. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this day was 2,000 years ago as Jesus goes in, Lord, and we are thankful that this was part of the plan. And even though it was part of the plan, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and that they will be destroyed in 40 years. But Lord, we know that is your judgment on them for rejecting the stone, the cornerstone. But we also know, Lord, that it's part of the plan that they would reject so that the Gentiles could come in and that Jews and Gentiles both would be sons and daughters of Abraham. We can't even conceive it, but it is perfect in the mind of our all-wise God. And so he is due all praise and glory. So we love you and we thank you. And I pray for those who have yet to cry out hallelujah in salvation that they would do it today. In Jesus' name, amen.